Um, our second speaker this evening is Joe Wei, uh, and I'm delighted to introduce him. Born in Hong Kong, Joe Wei earned a degree in architecture from UBC in 1964 and spent two years working for the Greater London Council in England. Prior to founding his own architectural practice in 1978, he worked in the offices of Arthur Erickson and for eight years at Thomson Berwick and Pratt. Wei has been the, re the recipient of many awards, including numerous City of Vancouver Heritage Awards for the Millennium Gate, the Chinese Cultural Center Museum and Archives at 555 Columbia Street, and the restoration of the Chinese Freemasons Building, which also received a special AIBC Jury Award. He serves as a mentor for UBC's School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture, and generous, generously spent time with one of our summer interns, uh, Sam Mickelson, who wrote a short document about the Spota story in 2011, when we opened our first Joe Way special on the Vancouver Special House Tour that year. The Strathcona project that Joe will be speaking about tonight came to him relatively early in his career, but reflects the kind of projects that have become a focus of his practice, Joe Y. Way Architect, Inc. His is a small firm of five employees that focuses on cultural facilities and housing projects designed to house people within communities, very much outside of the speculative housing construction industry that dominates Vancouver. Recent Vancouver projects have included the Villa Cathay Care Home, the Britannia Community Care Caring Pavilion, Carving Pavilion, and the Squatches Healing Lodge, a housing project of the Vancouver Native Health Society that incorporated the restoration of elements of the site's existing heritage building at 31 West Pender. We're very pleased to have Joe with us tonight to speak both about the architectural style that has been termed the Joe Way Special, an example of which will open on this year's Vancouver Special Tour, and the history of Strathcona that gave rise to its design. So I'd like to welcome Joe. than I do. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for me to speak. I first of all like to uh, recognize the first city councillor who was supporting heritage. It seems like she's still doing that now. Marguerite Ford is with us. <laughs> and two ladies who were instrumental in the Strathcona Rehabilitation Program and into House. Shirley Chan and her family helped to found Spota, and without them, we won't be standing here talking about anything. So, <laughs> Mr. Canning, a longtime Strathcona resident, and also the chair of the committee, which I reported to when we're doing the interview housing. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, there are others, but I think them will be introducing the rest of the half hour. Um, this uh, infill, it was called infill housing program. I, I was quite surprised and somewhat embarrassed that we called it a Joe Way special. It never meant to be that well. way. Uh, there are 10,000 uh, 10, Vancouver specials. There are several uh, generations of Vancouver Specials. Sometime in the early 80s, uh, they had a new Vancouver Special competition. And out of that, it was the narrow house of 12 and a half feet was uh, um, created, and it was quite an interesting uh, process. Ours is really still, for me, the infield housing uh, project in Strathcona. And how we got there, I'm just going to give an overview uh, today because uh, it's a matter of um, going back 35, 40 years. Uh, people also ask why and how did I get involved in Strathcona. I, like most Chinese origin immigrants in those days, as opposed to today, <laughs> they don't land in Shaanxi. I, <laughs> We all go to Strathcona, and my maternal uh, grandparents had a house at 713 East Georgia Street. 
So Strathcona is also my first home in Vancouver. But the little I know what was happening, this is about early and mid 1950s. Then uh, years later, when you move away, I heard that our uh, parents, our uh, grandparents' house was expropriated. And they were well on to in their 80s and finally got a home in the new McLean Park housing project. And still, you know, I was in my early 20s and a student and quite understand what that was all about. Uh, how that it might affect the neighborhood and how it may eventually uh, change the neighborhood. So after going away for four or five years, coming back, I heard that uh, we are faced with a major crisis of the freeway going through Chinatown, Gastown, and half of Strathcona. So inadvertently, you get uh, involved in the uh, protest movement and, uh, and realize that not only the freeway was a big issue, uh, also the whole scale of demolition of Strathcona was the, the issue. We have young Shirley Chan and her family uh, and organizing Spoda where you have a neighborhood was about up in arms. Uh, the organization formed the Property to uh, Owners and Tenants Association with 98% people participating. And their message essentially is to stop uh, a full a whole scale demolition of, uh, uh, of the neighborhood and let's retain the sense of community. And this is going a little bit in contrast, not quite, of what Peter was talking about why are we retaining these old buildings that are historical? But we're, at this stage, the, the, the notion is not so much rebuilding duplicates, but keeping the, uh, uh, the community as it, as it was, because with these urban renewal plans, uh, along with the freeway, and there was no real service in the neighborhood. Street lights, uh, trees, roads were really uh, have been not maintained for 15 years in 1968. So, uh, <laughs> Rebecca, do I press this? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we're talking about the character you can see, it was taken about 40 years ago because of the cars. This is not the Model T, but <laughs> I thought these would be interesting because it gives you a flavor of what it was then and, uh, and, be, uh, and before the whole program you know, kicked in itself. It didn't really look as neat as this. It was quite uh, less kept. Uh, maintain, well, and well maintained. Well, we can call it however we want to call it, but I think it is a matter, in retrospect, it's a matter of a sense of a community. Whether you want to have a continuation of community or you want to scratch it, uh, by demolition, demolish the whole thing and start anew. And the, it was a really sounding message from the folks in, in uh, Strathcona at the time. So, <sighs> timing is almost everything. You have the new Trudeau government coming in at the time, and also eventually, very quickly, the team council in City, in city Hall. And they were quite progressive in at least listening to uh, the citizens, and there was the Strathcona Rehabilitation Program finally got started in 1971, running to you know, th three or four years later. And that began to help uh, re-establish the value of the neighborhood itself, as opposed to continuing on the plans that had been made before. Now, this is one of my favorite uh, photographs, of an image of how, after you start uh, maintaining the building, how, how, how almost timeless it does look. 
and how much of a character it has. There are many variations on the houses in Strathcona. Uh, it was built allegedly for the managers of the CPR in the late 1800s and early 1900s until they moved to the West End or O'Shaughnessy. You look at the little details of, uh, on, the, on the gable roof later on as time goes on, we try to uh, not copy them, but evoke the same idea, the same character of what it could be. I think anybody who were around on that day, in those days, will have an idea what this is all about. This is lot C and D. This is where the phase three of the urban renewal program was supposed to go. And that was the, one of the major um, uh, civic election issues in 1972. And by that time, the rehabilitation program was already in progress, and there was the matter of, of a, a changing a direction, calling it rehabilitation as opposed to renewal. Uh, I think it's a matter of words, but nevertheless, it's uh, a, a three-level government program was set up to help not only maintaining the streets and the infrastructure, but also a grant and, and loan to renovation of the houses or retouching. Aside from the houses themselves, the whole notion of the structure of the neighborhood. Uh, Spota again came up with an idea of having a park all the way through diagonally of the whole district. And this is a part of it which still exists today, and it was called, in those days anyway, it was called the Linear, linear Park. So you can actually walk at uh, Campbell and uh, uh, Pryor all the way to Chinatown through a pedestrian route, even in 1971. Then comes the infield program. After the city had been expropriating the, the uh, lots throughout the years since the mid late 50s, there were, there were houses being torn down, and finally it was discovered that it might be, oh, what do we do with the empty lots? And uh, I, I think it was uh, Shirley's idea to let's build houses for the, for the families. And this is 1972-73. The notion was to, to solicit some help uh, from the provincial government, which was also a new government at the time. Uh, the city was probably the last, uh, so they didn't start being uh, impediments to development, like we know recently they started a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> they seem to be the last one to be dragging their foot in cooperation. Uh, so the, the program itself, again, sort of, how are you going to pay for it? What are we going to build and who do we build it for? Well, the target was to build for low to modest income families and the, the operative word is families. And at that time, I don't know how to equate to the uh, income level of today, but uh, we're hoping that the payments for either lease or uh, 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 it would fit incomes with the annual income of about $8,000 a year. So it would be on the definitely the low end of, of the level at that time. The, there were a number of things, a program you have to find to uh, make it happen. Uh, cooperative housing had just been introduced in Canada. The first cooperative was just getting underway in Champlain Heights. So one easy movement for us to do at the time was to get a co-op. Now we had large meetings of all the perspectives, uh, tenants and residents. Uh, even it was very well explained in more than one language. Uh, they, I don't think they ever got the idea what a cooperative housing really was, but they're all for it. 
And so the first phase of this was to have uh, uh, as many units as possible on, a, on one piece of land, which is at five lots. Each lot is 25 foot wide. And how to build these things uh, was an issue again. And, and the, the, what we were thinking about is that it has to be fitting into the community as opposed to like the uh, muscle man on the beach and stand out and say how pretty I am. So it is trying to look at for the characteristics of the Strathcona housing. And again, not to duplicate them or not to copy, but the pitch roof, uh, partly to do with the bay window, but mostly to do with the pitch roof and also the porch. And the common grounds that a lot of the residents were having a vegetable garden in the back, <laughs> that we might be able to get more than two units in one lot, or the two units in one lot, three units in two lots. And you know, to look through that, we have to exercise our, uh, how do you say, new leverage of being a rehabilitation program uh, with the city and to get a new zoning. And I do remember spending a lot of time with the then acting director of planning, who was a, he was a really nice man, called Harry Pickstone. And he's the one who put together the zoning, which we call RT2 today. And now, of course, there are many variations of RT2, which allowed for uh, uh, row housing or duplex or a triplex. This is our uh, sketch for the first phase. The five, uh, seven units on five lots, and you can see the, the common ground in the far end of uh, the vegetable garden together. And uh, we're able to squeeze a sort of row housing of several of the buildings on a smaller uh, site. This is the another view. Uh, this is on Union Street, 730 Union Street. Uh, and under the CMXC uh, cooperative program. Actually, I have a picture which I can't find of a uh, number of us and the residents' families putting in the, putting the, doing the landscaping because we're about $1,000 short on the budget. Uh, So you see there are four on one side and then three on the other in a common uh, play space and the vegetable garden. And this, just, this shows the general sort of characteristics and how, how these uh, new houses are supposed to fit in. We had three phases. Uh, the first phase was finished in 75, the second a year later, and then the other one a couple of years ago later. The first space is five on th uh, seven on five, and the units are interesting. People say, "Where do you get the units?" I said, "Well, you can go researching on what is the most flexible uh, and uh, unit that are usable for uh, different kind of families. We go to we're not building a house for a specific family or specific people." you have to take a common denominator. Uh, we're looking at three bedrooms on top, two of them relatively small, one fairly large. You stack the services up and down, you have a kitchen dividing a family area or a dining area and a, a, a living room and the sta stairs on one side. This is not, not even, never mind rocket science. This is not even new architecture. This is a common denominating plan. But the only catch here is that we can, it has to be flexible enough that we can put them side by side, we can slide them around, we can flip them back in mirror position, uh, and it's because we have uh, uh, all the different lots, uh, different levels of um, the street, we have to be able to allow for them, some, so you've got to find a plan that is really flexible. Now maybe it's also a good time to introduce our, the uh, uh, full board 
on the easel there, which we made 40 years ago, trying to keep track of what phase and where all the houses are. A large uh, outline is this round counter rehabilitation area. The big yellow one eventually is the site of uh, the Maudan Gardens, which was uh, turned out uh, uh, from that empty lot that we saw a little while ago. The little yellow <coughs> one is the first phase. And the yellow ones, depending on the size of it, are phase two and phase three. The green, uh, uh, for the lower right-hand corner, diagonally goes through uh, uh, to the uh, left-hand upper corner, would be your uh, Lillia Park. Uh, this is more clear how variations of the plan can fit with each other. Some of them are even back to back. In a way, the phase two is most interesting because you have to fit on different kind of heights. Uh, 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 lots, some of them are higher off the ground by a whole, whole, uh, whole level, and some of them are, are sunk in lower than the, from the street. And some of them are, uh, you, you can actually uh, see them closer together, put them together, together, and some of them you have to really shove one of them back. Eventually, the empty lot that we saw a slide off early on turned out to be a large housing co-op. The Maudan uh, co-op itself, 120 units. This was done a good 10 years later and it completed in 1983. Also sponsored by Spota, who has a, by this time they have a housing arm called Strathcona Housing Area Society. And it was done in a way that eventually we might connect the whole thing in the Chinatown. And again, it's the emphasis is on low rise, uh, uh, two story at the most. Uh, but there's a bit of a change in, in, in character and style, it's all courtyard housing. And maybe we heard Vito talking that we don't redo old houses again and try to do a little more. Uh, uh, um, contemporary at the time. And eventually we also get to uh, help the Ukrainian Association do the seniors project on 800 block uh, Panda Street. Uh, they have their own specific uh, ideas of uh, the character of their building. Uh, and But we nevertheless kept uh, the pitch roof and the porch, and I think it's still doing quite well today. This is, that was about 1988. And this is the one for the Chinese United Church, and again the family and senior housing together on 300 block Dunleavy Street and Penda Street. But by this time, you know, after 20, 30 years, we begin to be able to pick off little details that are similar to original Strathcona character, but done in today's or later days terms. So that we can go back to the overall character of Strathcona. I know it's changed tremendously. There are many people who put a lot of work into it since then. And that's the beauty of it, because there are a lot of different ideas by different people uh, that has serviced within Strathcona and, and um, to make it the vibrant and quietly humming place that it is today. So, the special infield housing and the overall character that we made today. Well, thank you very much for listening.
For the Vancouver Special and the immigrants, was there a particular group of immigrants that was predominantly buying and building and buying those? These? No, the Vancouver Special. Oh, I, 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 you mean the ones that Guido was talking about? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't really know that. You're not sure. But these were primarily for people already in Strathcona or people who want to live in Strathcona in the 1970s. Uh, what's made possible for them to do it is, again, because the, the officials, when they really try hard, they can find something. And this was to do with the provincial government at the time, the BC housing of the day, that they found an old program called a leased whole program that they can actually make it to a point where people with $8,000 a year annual income can actually afford the monthly payment. Uh, subsequently, about 10, 15 years later, it, they can buy, uh, they can have to at least to buy. So uh, today, today, as you can see, some of the renovation taking place by the, by the new owners, uh, they all, most of them are, the single ones anyway, are, 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 are private ownership. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Some of them were. Um, I don't know exactly what it is. I do remember a large meetings. Uh, the people were lining up to see what part of it they can be part of. And, and I keep saying, the first seven who got into the co-op didn't really know it was a co-op. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I was on the edge there. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. There was another bank, kind of bank, it was special in Strathcona, which uh, is lying really low on Penda Street, about 700 block. Uh, and uh, I think that was about the time we were doing all these things. And I said, well, I hope we don't have to do that, because that, that one looked like, literally, like a shoebox. Well, they have RT2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 by now. They try to tailor it slightly different to different neighborhoods. I, I still think as a whole they're very conservative. Uh, at the time it was an innovative uh, notion to broaden the single family uh, zoning RS1. But that's 40 years ago. And, and uh, today I think people would like to think to see it's not a matter of uh, stock densification. It's how we're going to do it and how well we can do it. And, and with what character that we're going to try to maintain the continuity of our neighborhoods at the same time allowing more uh, developments. Because the RT2 is a very conservative uh, way of densification. And you can see, never mind um, uh, Asian where there were so many people, they have to live so close to each other. Uh, the Europeans themselves, the English and the uh, British, they have so many row housing for such a long time, and some of them are really elegant. And that was done, you heard of the terms of Georgian architecture, they are really well kept up, or Edwardian. These are hundreds of years ago, particularly the, the Georgian ones, a couple of hundred years ago. 
So the, the, the idea is not to, so much to copy uh, the, the uh, exactness of it, but I think the idea of uh, uh, how we would like to reinterpret this more dense uh, necessity that, all of, all of, uh, that we are, we're here as a growing urban center, and how, what character that we will emerge, as opposed to import everything that look the same everywhere. I won't mention what districts, but the areas in our city could have been anywhere in the world. And, and thank goodness that uh, Strathona has the notion to preserve the way it did, and, it, and the evolution has taken the time it did, and it perhaps has become a, a good example of how gradual densification can be. I don't know the answer you do or not. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Ackett. Well, the one thing that's interesting is the neighborhood in 1993 had the RT3 zone rewritten. <coughs> rewritten. Yep. And one of the components was the Joe Wood Special and the multiple units showing the city that there is density that can be put into these lots. And so the thing was rewritten so that not only was the principal house divided up into a number of units, you could combine two lots and put the infill in. And so you've actually got in that neighborhood a lot of density. And whenever the city launches some new laneway house program, density program, green thing, they come down and photograph everyone in the neighborhood because it's the only place in the city that has already done that. And so from putting those multiple units of use on, led the way to the further evolution of the bylaw to allow even greater flexibility within the neighborhood. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the key is it has to be livable. Uh, you can jam things together and then become really hostile with each other, and that doesn't work. And but partly to do with our own uh, relations with our neighbors and how uh, how the cultural change can be managed in such a way that is uh, one on one does not equals nothing, but one on one equals three. Yeah. So thank you, Joe, very much for giving us a real insight to um, the whole how the infill housing that you were responsible for came about. Um, and uh, we're still going to call it the Joe Way Special because we think it's a great name for it. Um, but really, thank you for, for, that, uh, for that insight. So really, just uh, remains to thank both our speakers very much for coming this evening and uh, uh, enlightening us in, on two very different topics, but uh, really fascinating. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us and uh, hope that we'll see you on the Vancouver Special Tour. Thank you.